this isn't a coup. Uh, Senator Durbin has gone to vote, and uh, as is customary, one of the members of the committee takes his place. Uh, and I'm in the chair now, uh, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, and uh, very pleased to have my round of questioning while I am taking the chair for Senator Dur Durbin. Uh, let me ask Dean Goloboff, uh, you have a, an extraordinary career yourself as a trailblazer, the first female dean at the University of Virginia. You had a distinguished clerkship with Justice Breyer, and before that, our good friend Guido Calabresi, one of the most distinguished judges and scholars in the United States at the Yale Law School, where you went as well. Uh, a number of us on this panel have talked about the legitimacy crisis that the Supreme Court faces, maybe the result of self-inflicted wounds, maybe the result of the times in which we live. But Justice Breyer's very thoughtful, deliberate, methodical approach, as was outlined by Judge Jackson as well, seems to be one of the hallmarks of his ability to bring the court together to overcome divides and disagreements, which in my view is very important at this point in the court's history. Would you agree? I would. And maybe you could elaborate as to why that is important for this court at this moment in its history. I think the court's authority, as Professor Mascott has been talking about, in the separation of powers really comes from its deliberative nature. It doesn't have the power of the sword. It doesn't have the power of the purse. What it has is uh, its reality and perception of being a neutral arbiter. Uh, and I think Ju Justice Breyer played a critical role in uh, enhancing and facilitating deliberation across all of the justices of the court. And I think everything that we know about Judge Jackson suggests she will do exactly the same thing. So the lack of trust and credibility is a threat to the court because it doesn't have armies or police forces or, as you say, the power of the purse. What it has is the trust and respect of the American people. Yes, that's something Justice Breyer talks about frequently in his writing and in his speaking, uh, is the fact that without the trust of the American people, the court simply can't do its job. The rule of law, the, the justices are committed to the rule of law, and the rule of law exists because the American people follow the rule of law and only do so when they have faith in the court. Um, let me ask, uh, and I think that point is very well said, uh, Congresswoman Beatty and uh, Mr. Henderson, uh, we are celebrating here a remarkable achievement. I've said it should have happened long ago. It's a leap into the present in the historic nomination by President Biden, the first black woman to the United States Supreme Court. But as much as we celebrate, as I pointed out yesterday, the decisions of the court in Shelby County and Burnovich that essentially have set us back, and especially in this area of voting rights, John Lewis was a great friend and hero to you and to me uh, on integration, backsliding as well. Maybe I can ask you to reflect on both of you, because you have such deep and broad experience and expertise in this area, about the ways that the Supreme Court has reversed some of the progress that was made in our own lifetime. Ms. Beatty, uh, Congresswoman Beatty, why don't you go first? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you for uh, that question. And I am sure that Congressman John Lewis is looking down on us in a hopeful manner especially as it relates to civil rights and voting rights. I think what we have to look at first, as was said by both of the professors, that the, the power is not in the policy or the Congress. So I think what this does with this confirmation would be, it would be a hope for the people out there to help us as members of Congress and also as senators that we have to first do our job. And I think we have an obligation to help those justices by sending them policy, sending them voting rights legislation 
that they can then do within the rule of the law what the people are looking for. So I think that it starts here. And I think that question is so wonderful as I am sitting here as a member in the majority, with members in the majority and the minority, that the work starts with the House and the Senate. And so if that question would allow me to say that I am willing, because voting rights is the fundamental of everything that we talk about right now, whether it is the freedom of speech, whether it is working with our police, whether it is being the voice for those who are voiceless, let's start by saying we're going to give not only this justice, but all of the justices something that they can look at and rule on because we've sent them something that we're united. And I would ask, since I'm here today and with that question, that I ask my colleagues that we start with voting rights legislation, that we look at where we are with nullification. If we look at where we are in that case with preclearance, if we look at history, the voting rights are in with this, and you know this well. The Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized in a bipartisan way five times. Four Republican presidents reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. Wouldn't this be a wonderful time in this America to build a better America if this Senate and this Congress could come together and send our justices something that they could rule on that would be reflective of our democracy? Thank you. Mr. Henderson? Senator Blumenthal, thank you so much for the question. Let me say at the outset that I support completely the response of uh, uh, Congresswoman Beatty. Uh, and believe her answer was full and complete. But let me also say that the right to vote is foundational of all other rights, as, ju as, uh, as Congresswoman Beatty alluded to. And so all the issues that we've discussed this morning, from free speech to uh, the rights of uh, individual victims in cases of police accountability or others, are all uh, tied to the right to vote. The Supreme Court decision, beginning with the Shelby County decision in 2013, with the uh, 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 Abramovich uh, decision of a couple of years ago, and recent interpretations of what the court has done by district court judges, raise serious questions about the fidelity of the court uh, to the role that Congress has been designated to address discrimination under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. The fact that the court seems to have gone out of its way to find ways of eviscerating the protection of the Voting Rights Act has taken us back literally to the period that existed prior to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was adopted. Some people consider that criticism to be hyperbolic, but the truth is the facts make clear that what is happening now to voters, particularly voters of color, younger voters, seniors, individuals with disabilities are in fact violations of that fundamental right to vote. When we deny access uh, to the ballot, therein lies the problem. And so we have petitioned uh, Congress, specifically the Senate, uh, to enact new provisions that would help to protect the right to vote. We are disappointed that uh, earlier this year, that effort was not undertaken uh, by the with the complete bipartisan support of the Senate. But we hope that in the future that will happen. I remind you that 16 members, Republican members of the Senate who voted for the Voting Rights Act in 2006 in the reauthorization have so far been silent on this question of whether to move forward on the act. We hope they have a second opportunity to Thank do you. so. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Henderson. I'm going to call on Senator Black.